to the cloud. There we go. And we can begin. So did you want to open for us, Aiden? Um, I'm more than happy, but if, if you could give me a little bit of direction as to like what I should say. I have a lot to say on this topic, but I'd love to know what you want me to refer to. And, and we all do, don't we? So we're just going to open with a discussion or um, an opening as far as why is this an important topic? And this is something that we can all like pitch in during the discussion phase. But we want to know how does this help the Green Party overall? We see almost you know, daily references. I have some ideas that I put down. We see almost daily references from Green Party members about battling mental health struggles. Some of this is what leads us to seek organizations and, and state at policy missions like the Green Party has that is inclusive or geared at being inclusive to everyone. Some of it is due to having to battle uphill to remain as a volunteer with the Green Party against opposition from the outside world. And some of it is stuff that we bring in, our health issues that come from biological or environmental issues. Tolerance of one another is the key to success towards our various mutual struggles. So Aiden uh, is really, uh, has shown, demonstrated a real capacity to stand up uh, when it comes to ableistic kind of language. And um, I have a link here that, that is, uh, will be provided, all the resources will be provided as an attachment when this recording is shared on YouTube. They have a really great thing called Ending the Silence for Youth. And it's it's a free program. It's available by request. But Aiden, would you like to speak a little bit on uh, ableism in, in regards to mental youth or mental, mental health? Totally. Um, and thank you for that introduction. I think it was really nice and well, well said. Um, so to start off, mental health is probably one of the biggest issues that gets overlooked as far as organizing and resources and capacity, especially in, you know, clim climate change accelerating. The state of the United States imperialism is accelerating. We see mass shootings every day, um, which takes a toll on our mental health. And when people think about organizing, a lot of the times they think about action, which is actually reactive rather than proactive, which is care networks. So me personally, um, and again, I, I didn't have any of these resources before I moved to the uh, Bay Area in California. And by the way, I use they, them pronouns, you know. Um, so I didn't know any of these things that I'll be bringing up. But what I did know is that there's a lot of stress within our communities. And a lot of it is by design. Um, so the amount of sugar that goes into our food, the lack of nutrition, all have uh, an effect on our mental health and our health in general. Um, the fact that if you're not getting enough water, you can be more prone to stress. That's another aspect that a lot of people forget when you're doing these organizing circles. I think one of the biggest issues when it comes to organizing within groups is that a lot of the organization is based off of ideology rather than humanity. And what I mean by that is that if you're in a group and you're all like, let's say you're all communists, you can be like, yo, ho, ho, let's go communism. Let's get rid of any type of hierarchy. Let's get rid of the state. The Green Party sucks because we're in infiltrating the state and it's not going to work. You know, even in that one sentence alone, mental health has been disregarded because you're not aware of one, the people who you're talking to, and then two, the people who need support rather than dissupport overall. And so for me, I, I kind of got disillusioned this last year trying to do a lot of work for mental health. Like my primary work is not only cooking for people, especially unhoused people, but making sure that our neighborhood has a green and open space. And greenery, we know, has a benefit towards mental health awareness. Um, and so in that organizing group myself, a lot of people are ableist, a lot, and yes, trauma, complex trauma. And, and you know, it's like some of us don't even say post-traumatic stress disorder anymore because it's all stress. It's, we have disorders regarding stress, but there's no post-trauma, it's continuous trauma. And that's where complex trauma comes in. But even in my group, you know, there's still this focus on ideology, but it forgets to mention who exactly are you talking to? Are you using I language? Are you taking responsibility for the language that's coming out of your mouth? 
are you projecting? And, and you know, in your organizing circle, it's, it's okay to say, you know, I've been having a really bad week. My friend got hurt. My so-and-so is whatever. I might not be as calm as I normally am in this organizing meeting. A lot of groups don't even have the space to open that up and make it available. Um, when it comes to the language that we use, people use things like, oh, this person needs to be on medication, which is 100% wrong. Like one, if, if we're well adapted to this ableist society that's constantly destroying life every single moment, there's something wrong with us. If we're able to communicate and organize well in that type of environment, then we are probably a part of the issue. Odds are, as Greens, we're not a part of the issue. We're trying to be a part of the solution. And so to say or to be prescriptive of what people need rather than open-minded and open-hearted as to letting other people describe what they need from the group as a whole, that itself is another form of ableism. Um, I, I don't know how much time I should take. I'll probably take two more minutes on this, but I think a lot of what we can do as groups is really focus primarily on our care networks rather than our organization networks. And what do I mean by care networks? I mean the people that literally organize with you day to day, um, those in your communities, the elders that need, you know, like a trip to the doctor's office if, they, if they're not able to drive that day. Those are the things that we should be prioritizing first. Um, if you have someone in your local community that you're organizing with and you know they're a parent, your group should be offering to, to have childcare on site or wherever to make sure that they can organize to the best of their ability. If you're in a, a small group and you guys are and, and you people are organizing in the streets and you know it's the hottest temperature on record, maybe you should relocate to somewhere that has shade, that has access to water, that has access to a restroom, that's mobility friendly. All of these things indicate care rather than just simply ideology. And the heart of it that I've learned is that regardless of our ideology, regardless of whether we're Greens or you know, Peace and Freedom Party or even Republican, those things don't matter if the people that you're working with, the goals that you're aiming towards aren't being met. And what needs to be met is making sure everyone has basic needs. And a lot of us are not in the right capacity ourselves to provide those basic needs. Like, like it's nominations period for me right now. I'm a candidate for office, but here I am getting a whole hill <laughs> for like 20 to 30 people today. I don't have the energy. I don't have the capacity, but I've been able to make sure I have the capacity because I've focused on those care networks. I made sure that I got something to eat before I did this. That I got something to drink. I'm making sure that the fires aren't on their low temperature. Um, and then I would hope whoever I'm organizing with, they'll be able to offer like, hey, do you have to go step away for a bit? That's all about care network. And that's the, in, in my opinion, one of the solutions towards ending ableism on an individual level, because we don't have access to the systems level. Hopefully one of us is in power and we're able to make those changes. But at individuals, we have to make sure that we're available for people to talk about the issues that they need. Make space for grief. Make, make space for belonging, make space for time, for care, for play. All of those things need to come into the forefront of our minds as leaders when we're talking about mobilizing different groups. And I think that's what I can bring to the table is that just start thinking about care networks. What does care mean? How do we care about each other individually rather than just as, you know, as quote unquote greens? Because it's people, not ideology, it's, it's um, movements not methodologies. It's making sure that people have the capacities to be whole in and of themselves, regardless of where they are. So that's my pitch. I'm gonna go continue um, cooking. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm here to answer questions, listen in, but yeah, totally, thank you. Thank you, Aiden. And that, you just, I, I love to hear you speak. It, it's so encouraging. There is hope for the youth people. <laughs> when you listen to a young person that, that is so articulate, about these, especially about the, the people that no one else really seems to really care about. So resuming uh, sharing my screen next, we have George Friday, who's going to speak about the importance of, of, of self-care and a balance of mind, body, and spirit. Thanks, Dee. Um, and Aiden was wonderful and said a lot of the same things I would say, maybe from a different place, but um, you spoke about Aiden's youth and they are young, 
I hope I'm not seen as a bookend as probably the oldest person on this panel, but that's cool. I can handle it. I'm trying to get to a stopwatch because I want to pay attention to time. So one more chance. And if I don't find it this time, I'm going to give up. Okay. Giving up on the stopwatch. All right. Howdy, everybody. Um, so mental health. I want to be able to talk about mental health and self-care because it is awesome if you're in a place where you have the resources to have a support group or maybe even a therapist or a good social worker that you know, but not everybody has that. So how can we support people who may not have the resources or the connections? You know, if you can't pay somebody $75 an hour twice a week or twice a month or whatever, or, you know, you're not in a support group, what works? And more than anything else, what's important is knowing yourself well and being able to identify where are the areas that you're more inclined to feel wounded, out of balance, and not your full self. A lot of that is a consequence of the culture that we're in and um, not getting stuck in that culture. So one thing that I would I encourage people to think about is there's not real, I don't have good phrases for things as part of who I am as a person, but where did you drink the Kool-Aid or how have you drunk the Kool-Aid? So, you know, there's racism, sexism, white supremacy, misogyny, heterosexism, ableism, all of it. So some of it is in your subconscious. If you're white, that's every day of trying to figure out how is white supremacy affecting me? For the rest of your life, as a white person, as a male, as a US citizen, as an able-bodied person, figuring out how the presence, constant presence of the systems of oppression have lessened your humanity. Now, I'm not trying to say this as a, um, a judgment, it's just reality. If you're born, in this country and you're white, white supremacy has been there and it's in there. And it's your job to get it out because it is harming you. Just as heterosexism harms people, um, misogyny and patriarchy harms people, all of that lie. Y'all, you wouldn't be in the Green Party if you didn't already know that all of it is lies to support and maintain status and power among a very few at the cost of all the rest of us. So what is that costing you? When you've identified what it's costing you, then you can start to mitigate it. And that mitigation might be something you have to do every day, like uh, addressing a chronic wound or a chronic illness. And a lot of what we deal with is chronic because it doesn't go away. You know, I'm always gonna be a black woman who has all kinds of things to be dealing with or whatever are the conditions that you're dealing with. So I'm gonna share with you what I think works best or what has worked best for me without having consistent resources for therapy or massage or all of the things that would help me feel groovy and less, um, I think homicidal and suicidal are the two things you wanna avoid in life. So that's what I'll say. So these are our, um, three areas, and if I think if you pay attention to these every day for at least five minutes and as much as 15 minutes, if you can, it'll keep you from being homicidal and suicidal. I actually guarantee it. Yes, I do. Okay, so first, first is just our bodies. Every day, do something that is just love, love, loving. Keyword is love, love, love your body. I don't care if it's a foot massage or you know getting your nails done or whatever makes your body feel great. I used to love dancing, but I'm not as able-bodied as I used to be. So dancing, chair dancing isn't quite as fun. Um, yeah, dancing to the Sex Pistols while I'm seated is not quite as fun as it used to be to be able to bounce around. But so take care of your body for at least five, 
five minutes every day. Something that just lets your body know, I'm so glad to have you. Thanks so much. Because, you know, we can't do jack shit with no body. So just love, love, love the body you have in whatever shape it's in, because it's what you got. It's your vessel. It's your vehicle. It's everything. All right. Then you got to for five, five minutes, at least five minutes a day. It's important, absolutely important for you to, this is magic. This is pure magic, y'all. Conjure joy. I'm not saying something that makes you happy because yes, happiness is an emotion. Joy doesn't exist until we create it. Joy, I mean, the feeling like you're about to float, like there's little sparkles all around your head, right? That is awesome. It's magic and you can create it. Um, I can't give you an example. Well, my one of my favorite examples is watching the movie Friday. There's part of the movie Friday where I laugh so hard, I think I'm gonna pass out. So, but that's joy because I get that lightheaded feeling. Okay, cool. Last one, five minutes a day, connect to the divine. I'm not saying go to church. I'm not saying pick up your Quran. I'm saying just as you know, because you're in the green party that all of this stuff is created to oppress us. So a few can benefit at the cost of everyone else. You wouldn't be in the green party if you didn't know we are all connected to everything. So do what works for you in those five to 15 minutes a day that give you that feeling that we are absolutely connected to everything. And there's lots of ways to do that. Sit by a brook or watch some babies play, whatever works for you. And if you do that every day, five minutes a day of love, love, loving your body, five minutes a day of conjure, conjure, conjure joy, five minutes a day of connecting, connecting to the divine. And you know, you'll be all right. All right, that's me. Thanks, D. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. And so I'm gonna share the screen again for the next part. Um, I wanted to kind of just draw attention to the different kinds of mental illness there are for people that that really don't even look into it. Um, for instance, people conflate those that experience depression with those that are maybe having visual and audio or dementia. And so um, at the end of the presentation, like I said, there will be a posting of links so that people can look into the different kinds of um, uh, health issues that, are, that exist. But I did want to just take an excerpt from a couple of sites and, and read this where it says mental illness, like physical illness, is on a continuum of severity, ranging from mild to moderate to severe. More than 60 million Americans have a mental illness in any given year. Mental illness affects one in four adults and one in five children. And honestly, I think post-COVID it's higher. But very few people, however, actually seek treatment for mental illness. The stigma as associated with mental illness is still the biggest barrier that prevents people from getting treatment or retaining their treatment. Mental illnesses are a medical are medical conditions that disrupt a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others and daily functioning. Just as diabetes is a disorder of the pancreas, mental illnesses are, are medical conditions that often result in a diminished capacity for coping with the ordinary demands of life. However, um, it also should be stated that with, with adequate treatment, it is something that can be you know, uh, managed and recovered from. So here are some categories, um, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, et cetera. Please, um, you know, for those people that have not, that have, you know, not really looked into it, um, really do some research um, and try to find out what the different kinds are so that you can begin to recognize maybe someone that needs the treatment that's not receiving it. And so um, I have uh, here a couple of interesting links um, that also will be provided um, in the, in the uh, uh, link that's attached to this video. And it's so interesting because the assumption is that if you're 
open or acknowledge that you have mental health issues that that you're not okay all the time and that's not true um there have been many great people out there that have led entire nations that suffer from mental illness and here's just one example from this little website you know we have abraham lincoln who suffered through depression throughout his life we don't we're not saying stalin was a great leader but obviously there were mental health issues there uh dr king suffered severe depressive episodes. Um, even as an adolescent, um, they, they, they are saying that, that he uh, had two suicide attempts. And I did research this on other sites. So um, think about what really motivates some people to become leaders. Maybe it is just realizing how messed up the world is and deciding to, to stand up and, and, and fight. Um, as you, you know, Diana, and so on and on. And so I'll give you the list of links. Um, but this is something I wanted everyone to consider is that because someone is experiencing mental health challenges does not mean that they cannot actually be effective communicators and leaders. Uh, here is something, another thing that we're, we'll have in our references, and this is on um, a strategic interactive chart. And if you look in the different areas of this chart, you'll see some really, really important information that, that links to um, different areas concerning mental health. So for, for instance, one of the newer things they're doing is neuroscience, where they're really looking into the patterns of the brain activities they'll measure. Like for instance, a person who has PTSD, and uh, when they, they measure the brain, they're finding out that uh, with, with sensory stimuli that, that triggers that, that PTSD episode, certain areas of the brain light up. And so I'm, I'm hoping that they'll continue with this pattern. It'll become more of a commonplace thing than a rarity. And so uh, please, if you are interested, take a, take a moment to check out this chart. And next, uh, the next presenter will be Daryl Moak, who works with people in mental health and, and his community. And he's going to share his ideas and his thoughts and his reflections on his work. Thank you, Dee. And thank you, everybody, for coming here for this important conversation. I'm really looking forward to the discussion part to hear what people are thinking and what your experiences have been. Uh, so as Dee said, I've been doing mental health work for that is one portion of my career path. I have my degree is in a master of education and counseling, and I have served as a psychotherapist. I write cur curriculum for mental health programs, and I have provided counseling, community support, and do training for other mental health professionals um, currently. So this is, I live in this world, and in, in ministry, I'm also doing a lot of pastoral care and have done pastoral care and counseling. So this is a part of who I am. A lot of my arts work lives in this realm as well. A lot of my art is about healing and um, and working people through the things that are going through. I wanna highlight something that Dee pointed out um, in one of the slides, and it talked about mental health um, issues going from mild to moderate to severe. So I ask you the question to think about this. Who in your world that you know, including yourself, who doesn't have some kind of mental health challenge? I believe that mental, the question about mental health challenge is, uh, is really a, a misnomer because it is it is more, everyone has something. We've all had, most if not all people have had some kind of trauma or experienced some trauma, some more than others and some more pervasive than others. And here's the word that you want to be looking at, this idea of pervasiveness. How does what's going on in a person's life impact their ability to function? And that's how we determine how mild, how moderate or how severe the mental health issue might be. So for some of us, we might get a little sad from time to time. We lose a job, we get sad for a little while, we put out some applications, we find another job and we move and we go on and we get another job and we're okay. But that sadness falls in the realm of depression. But for some people, they manage through it very well and so it doesn't impact them as much. Some people may have things going on for a long time and not realize it. Some people who can't like wake up sometimes or can't get out of bed or they wanna sleep all day for a day or two and then they get going again. 
these are things that uh, as long as it's not impacting someone, we don't pay attention to it. But when the person can't go to work because they can't get out of bed and they don't buy their food or they don't take care of their kids or these things begin to happen and they start impacting the quality of their life or the life of those they're responsible for, then we call it a mental issue or an illness. Whereas it's really just a continuum of things of us managing life, stress, trauma, and issues. So um, one of the things that I've been concerned about and one of our guests on the, here today pointed it out about the discrepancy and the lack of the kinds of care that are available in different communities. Oftentimes in communities of color and poorer communities, there are fewer resources available. And even if those resources are available, fewer people take advantage of them because of the stigma associated with it. So one of the challenges that we have this today and why I love the fact that Dee wanted to do this presentation and why we all agreed to do it really is to demystify this idea of mental health and take out the stigma of it, to recognize that all of us come to the table with some stuff. Somebody has been, if any of us have been through any abusive situation, if we've had any loss in our lives, um, deaths in our lives that were devastating, um, any other kind of major physical illness that, that caused you to, um, to have to be in the hospital for a while, those are traumas. All of those are things that are affecting our mental health over time. We may manage them better. We may live through them differently. We may be less sensitive to it. Um, in some communities, particularly in poor and urban communities, people can be very, very desensitized to the trauma because it's going on around them all the time. When you're hearing ambulances all the time, you, you, you're not as alert to the ambulance anymore, right? But, but that is a trauma because you're blocking out the fact that your mind is wondering what happened um, to someone. Um, it, did someone die? You're hearing gunshots all the time in some urban communities and maybe in some rural communities. What happened to someone? Um, these are things that, that happen all the time, but we get desensitized because we're oversaturated by these kinds of things. And this is what I see working with young people, which is one of the particular areas of my specialty or working with children and adolescents and um, primarily adolescents is that they can be overstimulated and oversaturated by the traumas and therefore they function, but they're functioning differently. And when you remove a person from those environments, they begin to either thrive better or they don't know how to function at all because it's outside of what they become used to in their norm. So we have a lot of work to do, I believe, in helping people to normalize this idea that getting counseling or getting some assistance, talking to someone about stuff that's going on, not having to hold it in, not bottling it in, is appropriate, but also taking breaks. George was talking about self-care. One of those items of self-care is taking a break, being able to say, you know what, I'm burning out and I'm not, I'm becoming toxic for myself and anyone around me. It's not that I'm bad, it's not that I'm doing anything bad necessarily, but if I keep going the way I'm going, I'm not doing anything good or well, right? So being able to know when to take breaks, when to step away, that it's not going to die, especially in the Green Party, right? Um, somebody, Cynthia McKinney is one of my mentors. And when I was running, planning to run for state Senate in Georgia, she was working with me on that. And um, my, I got a call from my family that said, hey, we need you to go move to Arizona of all places and take care of my great, great aunt of all things to do. And the logic was, I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids at the time. I was, and I had a background in mental health and knowing what she was going through. And I'd be more helpful than anybody else would be. And her children wouldn't do it. So, um, so I, I was, I was reluctant, but, but I talked to Cynthia and I was like, but Cynthia, I'm getting ready to run for office. And it's the perfect time to do this. This person has been in office since I was, the year I was born was the first time he was elected. It's too long, right? She goes, Daryl, Politics will always be there. We will always need you somewhere. Go and take care of your family. That is your first priority. So I'm going to take the same advice that she gave to us and say to all of us here, take care of yourself. That is your first priority. The Green Party provided that we don't implode on ourselves. We'll be here politics, the need for what we're doing in our community is going to be here until we fix it. And the way the system is set up, it's going to take us, it's, 
taking us a couple hundred years to get here. It's going to take us a little while to get out of it. So take care of yourself, right? Do what you need to do. It is okay if you need medication. I tell my young people when I'm working with them for the very first time, you might need medication for a little while. You might need it all the time. It's like any other kind of thing that's going on. You might need something to help with the chemical imbalance that might be why you have what's going on. So sometimes mental health is based on environmental things. Sometimes it's based on our natural genetic makeup. Whatever it is, see somebody, talk to somebody, find out what your alternatives are. And you, uh, medication in terms of Western medicine is only one alter, alternative. You can also do homeopathic remedies and other kinds of um, Eastern meditation, uh, Eastern medications that are just as powerful as um, any other kind of Western um, pills and tablets and liquids and, and shots and things like that. So know your options. But the most important thing is not to not to stigmatize people, not to put people down, especially in our communities where we're seeing what's happening and we're in the Green Party. Have compassion and encourage somebody to take a moment, take a break um, and give people grace. We all need it. Thank you very much, Daryl. And that, that's really good advice, because uh, as long as it's not taken wrong. And it should never be public. It should be like, are you okay on a side and reaching out and, you know, it's everything okay. And, and uh, there are a lot of members who are in the party that do that, you know, it's, and that, that's really a good thing to continue and encourage among others. So going back to sharing the screen here, we did have a mental health professional that was going to be here. She had a family emergency and couldn't make it. So we're going to next then move on to Robin Harris, who's going to speak on the effects of COVID-19 for about five to seven minutes and um, on men social mental health, which is something alluded to by Aiden, and um, mass shootings and other societal displays of internal challenges. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Um, thank you for having me um, on this panel. Um, <clears throat> everything has been uh, um, great that's been said so far. I'm going to try my best to tie all this together. Um, some of my assignment is uh, it's from an activist point of view and what Dee said, uh, how to tie all this in was uh, with COVID impacts, um, gun violence, it's different things from a, um, I guess from a social justice um, frame. And so we're now, I guess you could say post, um, post COVID pandemic issues. Um, but um, if any of us, most of us, obviously we survived that. And it was the, the climate um, politically and socially was, uh, was very uh, taxing on us as activists, on us as, uh, as, as leaders. Um, it was even very taxing within the party and, and not to, uh, this is not going to be anything uh, so much as to, to vaccine or not to vaccine. Um, but I, I, I want to address some deeper issues around COVID uh, and how it, it, how it did impact uh, and how it could impact uh, in a mental health, uh, from a mental health frame. So I want to, I want to talk about something that, that was rarely talked about, if at all. I want to view this whole the whole COVID idea and other issues as we talk about trauma, uh, mental health issues, bipolar, all these things. But I want to I want to bring up a, a word that we don't talk about. It's called epigenetics. Epigenetics. Epigenetics is the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. Um, and also a little bit more influences, environmental, uh, environmental influences such as persons, a person's diet, diet and exposure to pollutants. And this is important, right? Because um, when um, COVID, you know, we had, there was so many levels as to, you know, what, uh, what, what dialogue of people uh, were gonna be impacted by, by COVID or what, what groups were going to be uh, impacted, or and how, um, you know, frontline. Just it was so many things, and with, within our very DNA, because of trauma, and when you study epigenetics, we see that 
um, as far as African Americans, that from the beginning of colonial from slavery, we when we were brought from the continent and brought here, we were forced to eat a diet that we were not used to. So these Corbett more these Corbett mortalities that were talked about a lot deeper than that. Um, we were we were consistently fed a diet of uh, cornmeal and fat, and so that had an impact upon uh, our genetic system. It's not that just you know all black and brown communities eat bad, so therefore they're going to be um, targets for for COVID. It's a lot deeper than that. So then there is this conversation now that we must have about reparatory justice. Uh, not only are we frontline workers um, in this or during that pandemic or during this pandemic or post pandemic, not only were we frontline workers, but we were taking the the hit uh, again medically and medicinally. It wasn't just because uh, black people didn't want to get vaccinated or uh, black people. It, it's, it's so much more. These very issues um, medically were within our DNA, and that's what made us maybe more at, at risk. And if anyone, I would challenge you to read, and I know those, those, are, those are some on the line now, to read medical apartheid. Um, Black people have been, um, have been victims of scientific racism. And so me as an activist, as an activist social justice worker, why wouldn't I bring up that? Um, that we have the very right to question what goes in and out of our bodies. And, and so um, I think mentally it was, it, it, it was uh, an injustice um, because sometimes we couldn't have those conversations publicly because of fear of maybe being scrutinized in a negative manner. But for years, we've been the guinea pigs of colonial, of colonial colonized medicine. And so it was just, for some of us, it was just a way of wanting to say, hey, that um, we want to be whole, we want to be well, but can you please listen to us? So these, um, these atmospheres are sometimes were kind of diluted, um, sometimes kind of whitewashed. And I think, again, it goes back to, uh, some of that goes back to fear. And also I think that the real challenge, the real culprit is the lack of a, uh, of a quality healthcare um, in the United States for any of us. And so again, there's my push, uh, there's my activist push again for quality education uh, and quality and quality healthcare. And so with that being said, um, uh, I talked about a lot about this frontline work. And so I think that's a sad way. During the COVID, uh, up, during the COVID pandemic, we were faced, many of us um, uh, had to endure being on front line during the George Floyd rebellions. <clears throat> Meaning that when George Floyd was killed was at the height, the, uh, the epitome of COVID happening. <clears throat> and so I, I remember uh, here in Orlando, Derek Chauvin's uh, other home is located here in Orlando. <clears throat> I remember us unmasking and going out and being on front line to face those rebellions in spite of COVID. And so we, we again were on the front line. And that was um, that was that was uh, traumatic in some cases because we were willing to put it all on the line to stand for someone that could no longer stand for themselves. So, um, so we had that. And the next thing I was uh, in, in this uh, component, it was a conversation around gun violence. So oftentimes gun violence is seen as, uh, you know, just uh, who should be armed or who shouldn't be armed. And, and those again are conversations that must have a more, have more expansion to it. Um, I wanna read something, um, hopefully this makes sense uh, because gun violence again, and it, and it bothers the mental psyche because it's really disarming black people um, because gun control is really about when you go back to the days of the Black Panthers, it's all about there's this aim, the target to disarm Black people. 2010 Supreme Court case McDonald versus Chicago, Justice Stephen Berger wrote a dissent that assented uh, District of Columbia versus Heller should be allowed to ban guns. Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg joined that dissent. 
and it was a litany of restrictions and those were products of Jim Crow. So for me as an activist, it's often these things that I fight for, things that I stand on the front lines with people for, it's, it's often very traumatic and because it's almost like going in a circle that never ends, never ever ends. And what I think George has said about self-care, um, what Daryl said earlier about the fight, the struggle is gonna always be there. We don't want it to be there, but it's gonna be there. And so we have to often um, take time out to, to quiet our minds, to quiet our spirits, to meditate, um, to look within ourselves. I have to, I have to do that often. Um, many of you know, because last year, you know, you, you highlighted the, uh, uh, the post mass shooting. There was a time that I felt is that everything was my fault because that I couldn't do anything because I didn't see any change. Um, no matter uh, how many gun rallies I attended, uh, nothing was gonna get changed or I felt that way. And it's just now that we're starting to see some, uh, some hint of maybe making a change. And so we have to, when we do this work, we have to mentally separate ourselves from the work and the person. Uh, and so often, I, sometimes I confuse that, the work with my self-worth. And many times I have to take myself out of the situation and look for healing. And what I would like to say to the party is this, when, when Black people speak, please hear our hearts. And because during this whole COVID thing, there was so many, there was so much uh, just animosity. And I don't think it was intentional, but it, it shot up. And so please hear our hearts. We've lived this, we've experienced this on many levels. And it's not often to, to try to shut someone down or to, uh, or to leave anyone out of the conversation. But we wanna be heard, we wanna be respected. Uh, I bring up again the book, Medical, Apar uh, Medical Apartheid. Um, our brains have been, uh, have been put on display as black people because a white man said we, we weren't as smart, as worthy as, as other white people. So when we speak, we speak from years of experience. We speak from generations of experience. So if you could please listen to us and understand that um, for this healing to take place, we have to learn to listen to one another. And um, I think that's my time and I will submit that to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Robin, um, well said. So a lot of people may, <clears throat> Is. I was just, you know, dinkering around, like trying to do a little bit of research um, and found an interesting quote that was uh, from them. And I'd like to explore it more. I'll also put this in the uh, references, but there's a quote from that person that says it may easily turn out that they are not prepared to meet us on a level of rational argument. Uh, begin by denouncing all argument. They may forbid their followers to listen to rational argument because it is deceptive and teach them to answer arguments by the use of their fists or pistols. And then the famous one-liner, um, this is excerpt from this article. And it says, we should therefore claim in the name of tolerance, the right not to tolerate the intolerant. Oddly, many discussions of Popper's paradox in there, but in the footnote, he goes on. We should claim that any movement preaching intolerance places itself outside the law and we, would, we should consider incitement to tol intolerance and persecution as criminal in the same way as we should consider incitement to murder or to kidnapping or to the revival of the slave trade as criminal. So it's not just self-defense against violence, fists or pistols, it's incitement. And I'd like everyone to consider that when we are you know, not listening to one another and trying to shut each other down. Because to me, trying to silence someone is another form of violence. Uh, next part of my presentation is just an encouragement for people to stand up. <laughs> Pretending that we are okay when it's obvious to everyone else that we're not okay is not okay. This will not help those of us in our communities that are struggling toward achieving fair representation in American society. It enables those that ascribe to ableism or that are in denial of their own health matters. 
When we are not mentally doing well, there are alternatives. You can get help from a trusted professional. And I have a list of resources that I'm gonna give people, especially those of us in the black community, um, because it's so very difficult in some areas to find a therapist that is actually qualified to address the, the different levels of issues that, that we, we carry. Um, so alternatives are to seek help from a trusted professional. And it may take a lot of frogs to find the prince or princess in the mental health field. Not everyone that is quote unquote qualified is qualified. So you you know there's there's people in there that just can't relate to you, especially if you're bringing issues as a minority or you know as a another oppressed demographic. Not everyone's qualified to deal with your particular set of issues you're bringing to the table or able to separate yeah. what society from what's actually um, your issue. Compare um, notes. Uh, compare notes with uh, trusted friends about what's on your mind. And of course, we have to be careful there because sometimes we we trust the wrong people and they may use, you know, our, our vulnerabilities against us. But we all know who our friends are that we've had for 10, 12, 15 years that will never turn on us. And, and it's always, you know, we can go to them for a little insight when we're struggling. Fight the stigma and fearlessly let trusted friends and cohorts know that you're experiencing challenges and may not be your best self as you navigate these challenges. And finally, take the brick and drop it. I have a, a, an older friend who always compares, you know, whatever issue uh, that we're facing at the time to, to holding a brick. He says, drop that brick. And it's always the best advice because it means let it go, basically. Um, and you don't get caught in that spiral of, of just carrying that weight. Mental health challenges are normal for rational thinking people, not the exception. If you fear having your judgment always questioned due to an open admission of mental health challenges at some point or another, the worst thing we can do is to continue to perpetuate stigma by trying to hide it or point the finger at someone else as the source of your own struggles. And finally, we will close with a memory of our uh, youth representative and beautiful um, global and uh, social justice activist, Jennifer Hyman. We love you. Your spirit is and will always be beautiful. You live with those of us you have touched in our hearts. You're loved. Again, I have resources that will be attached to the video. And now we will close and open up for discussion. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, Bernie. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm Bernie August. I'm from Delaware. And I ran for US Congress a couple of times. Not that I'm getting to all that. Um, I'm really very, very happily, I have attended previous um, plenaries on this within the party. And I have worked as a mental health for, for NAMI back in the 80s. Uh, as a uh, patient rights advocate working at Delaware Psychiatric Center because I have a family member who is really bad with mental illness. I suffer from it myself. Um, but what I like, I heard today is something that all of us need to reaffirm. And George said it perfectly. Give yourself that time every day uh, to feel good, touch yourself. Hey, I'm here. I'm living. You know, I just turned seventy, <laughs> and and I have been taking a physical beating in the last three years from COVID and heart disease and a whole bunch of things. I'm pulling through. I haven't given up. You know, but it's just very frustrating. You know, and I found out the best thing for myself is I just turned the goddamn news off. You know, you just can't listen to the news. Um, you know, I mean, and then listen to the altar, not that not, I'm saying that the news, there's different ways to get your news and there's different ways to accepting that if you, you know, if you know what I'm saying, I think so, but I really want to thank you for this. Uh, I will download your slides and, you know, and still use them, you know, but my problem is, is that 
I've been dealing with uh, mental health issues in youth and the prison system. And it is awful. And Delaware, the prison has become the psychiatric center. And there has been a really a lot of shootings of youth by youth in Delaware. And, and it's just terrible uh, trying to get like uh, people. I have a grandson who's in prison because of a mental health issue and trying to get him help, trying to get him his medication, keeping him consistent, you know? And it, it, it's just become really taxing and, and alienating. It really is. So all of us here that are involved in this issue know what I'm talking about. You do have to give, and also tell I'm gonna switch off now, but again, I wanted to say thank you. And Robin, you're great. I love you, dear. You, she done good today. And what you say is very beautiful. Uh, we're fighting, we're fighting in a very oppressive system. Your comments about me being the white guy understands that. I'm the union organizer. So I don't want Richard Perr. I'm here in Delaware, where some of the largest corporations in the world just crush anybody on the left. It's, it's been horrible for me. But I'm still keeping the party alive, but I have to keep myself alive first. You know, and I had really bad COVID experience. I'm still can't breathe right. I still can't. Yeah, I'm on an oxygen tank. You know, I lose my air. Long COVID now, two and a half years. I had it like in 2019. So, but like I said, I can't give up on myself. But thank you so much for sharing with us, Bernie. And I see Gail's hand up as well. I just uh, want to kind of piggyback. Okay. Uh, and backtrack a little bit um, based on what um, Bernie was stating regarding resources. And so here, um, I, you know, is my list of resources. I, I want to uh, ensure that everyone takes a look at them. Um, these there, there are things, uh, resources for people of color. Here is a really long list of different organizations, LBG. L LGBTQ psychotherapists of color and, and different links. So therapy for black girls. There's a podcast out there um, that, that is uh, called the therapy for black girls, of course. Hold on one second. And of course they'll likely call right back, but I just want everyone to see that they're you know, you can keep looking and and it's very important, I think, to have culturally specific um, therapists and resources. And uh, there's some for young people, black led resources for mental health, etc. So we still have about 20 minutes for discussion and I'm going to stop sharing and I believe that Gil Obler is on the stack. Thank you. Hi, Gail, are you speaking? If you are, you are. Yeah, I was muted, uh, my fault. Uh, so what I'm gonna say is, is uh, highly anecdotal, but I think still significant. Um, uh, so a number of years ago, um, I had some, I had to avail myself of some mental health resources, you know, and I'm a large white middle-class guy. So it isn't about the patient. Um, my experience, um, was at three locations, um, one uh, in Cambridge near where my sister lives, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and another was in uh, it, a, uh, services that were in the, in the Bronx uh, where I was living. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, the third was at Columbia Presbyterian in Harlem. And uh, two of those, um, uh, I did not experience nor uh, see anything like what I saw at Columbia Presbyterian, uh, which was significantly different. And it, in particular, in the, uh, the intake, the emergency room intake for those services uh, was populated by Homeland Security officers who were clearly um, uh, physically abusing um, patients. Um, and you know, I even had the opportunity later to talk to the doctors in that facility, 
and they they couldn't stand it. They were uh, as uh, they were as much horrified by that situation. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me an accident that um, the, the the difference in the way that the uh, that the mental health services were were, were um, offered to the community um, and to different communities. Um, is my point. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there so people understand, uh, you know, some of what's really going on uh, in this sphere. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. And Christopher, hi, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. I apologize. I'll take it down. Um, I had a question for everyone uh, uh, with regards to mental health access. Um, as a local party, I realize that the world has largely changed since the actions of the Panthers back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, where they were making act action like here in Portland, where they were setting up clinics and doing those sorts of things to circumvent the, the oppressive institutions of power that were disenfranchising huge portions of the communities, not just simply um, uh, black community, but everyone. And they were providing that as a meaningful resource. And those clinics are in here in Portland still in existence. Uh, but my question is, what thoughts has the party and, and has the community um, considered about um, trying to formulate some way that, that we could potentially follow suit to make a direct action when we have such vast shortages of clinicians and other things to be able to help our, our community? Excellent question, Christopher. And I think that's why we felt it was very important to open up this discussion because at this point, this is just an initiator. It's, it's you know something that can be developed further by people like yourself that have an interest in starting things in this direction. I know in Chicago, um, the mayor, Lori Lightfoot, has started a whole new program within the community to help people with mental health um, struggles. And I think it's the last frontier uh, in regards to discrimination. So, you know, definitely if you see something that you can do to start having that discussion and, and creating those, those spaces, um, all you know, everyone needs to pitch in for the usual Green Party style and get those things going. I see Robin's hand up. Um, I'm not sure if there was someone prior to Robin, but I do see Chris Mann from Missouri as well. So Robin and then Chris. Yeah, just real quick. Um, thank you for that question, Christopher. Uh, one thing that we're, uh, that we're trying to do in uh, Orlando, we have uh, Central Florida Mutual Aid. And so we're trying to, uh, you know, recently I've had a couple of people to uh, ask for mental health assistance. And so what we do is we're trying to identify therapists and other folks that may be willing to gift, um, you know, give some of their time uh, to be able to, uh, to help those in need because uh, sometimes it's, you know, it's either gonna be a sliding scale, which sometimes aren't, isn't that bad, but sometimes people don't even have that. So through our mutual aid, we're trying to set up, a, we're gonna try to set up a network uh, to try to assist people in those in those areas. Thank you, Robin. And Chris Mann and then Daryl Monk. Hi, um, I wanted to see if anyone uh, that spoke has any experience with um, children or adults now that have experienced sports injuries concussions and things like that. And um, because we're finding it kind of hard to get uh, people that have knowledge about that, that th those are serious um, injuries that result in seemingly mental health issues, but, but they're, they're neurological. And a lot of the brain, current brain research uh, came as a result of uh, the study of autism, which is an epidemic, and that's neurological also. And um, I want to thank the Black Caucus for your guidance on through the pandemic on 
I, for one, uh, we had a medical doctor that didn't believe in all the vaccines and he wasn't a right winger. He just didn't want all the chemicals. And so I found the Black Caucus was uh, more broad and more um, realistic about putting things in your body that Big Pharma wants to make money off of you by doing. And um, there was one other comment. Oh, uh, Missouri, we had a, a, a webinar on um, mental health and being an activist. And one of the most, uh, uh, to me, touching speakers was the union president out in California, out in um, San Jose. He, um, he was talking with workers before the shift and there was the mass shooting. Another coworker shot eight other members and just the courage he he had to me uh, to, and what well, he's ch a changed person um, in, in, a, in bad ways and good ways in that he's now seeing the need for so much more mental health among union union workers he's put that at the forefront of the you know their union their locals demands is to be, you know, have care for all that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your input and thank you for the support, Chris. Um, that was quite a challenge going through the hours of uh, debate regarding our perspectives versus as a community versus what some wanted to paint as the narrative. I'm sure it will continue um, at some point, maybe by those that want to pick it, pick it up and, and continue that struggle. Okay, so so Daryl, I see that you're on stack as well as Anne. Yeah, so a couple of things I wanted to respond to um, Christopher's um, question um, also. So it uh, used to be that you could call anywhere in the country, you could call 1-800-CHARTER. And I worked for them at one time. And although it was a business and they were in the business of making money, obviously they were private psych psych psychiatric facilities, but their 1-800 number, you could call that number and anyone in the country from wherever you were, you could also get through the access help helpline direction to get the care that you were able to, to get access to. And they would stay on the phone with you and help you do that. I know because that was part of my, one of my jobs with, with them at, initially. But in DC, th that doesn't exist anymore. What I did learn is that the United Way has a book and I'm not, I can't say they're still making but they were making this book that had all of these resources and they were gathering data from all across the country. And so the United Way still might be a place to call to find out where can I get access to something. And they usually have lots of things there. I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but I can't imagine that they stopped. Um, but in DC, everyone can get access to mental health treatment regardless of their ability to pay. We have something here that DC pays for called local dollars. And that allows a person to get access to um, therapy, psychiatry, community support, mental substance um, use um, support and services, all based on, all free, basically. If you live in DC, it's just kind of free. If you're on Medicare, DC Medicaid, or any of those things, it's definitely free. If you have private insurance, you can still go to some of those clinics that are funded by contracts with DC Department of Behavioral Health and, and pay a sliding scale or pay whatever your insurance copay is and things like that. But there are two different side types of clinics that are set up to be able to do that. Some do all of it, some do one or the other. Um, so that's partially in DC. I also worked in the clinic that was in Maryland and Maryland's system is similar to DC's in that you can call a, a main number and get access. In most places, I think 311 has become a number that people can dial and it goes either to your county or your city or your mayor or somewhere and say, hey, I got a problem with this, who should I call? They'll give you the right numbers or get point you in the right direction or transfer you to the department or the division that might do that. Now, we all know that that's a whole lot of runaround too because you may not get the right people the first time. So if you're going to recommend any of those things to people who are having a struggle, you have to encourage them to be patient with that process 
um, and not because that process itself can be overwhelming and can become another mental health challenge of just a frustration <laughs> of being able to do it. Um, lastly, to Chris's question, um, I have not um, worked on the on the other side of that issue with children and adolescents. I have been an advocate at one point in some place where I've lived at um, the right kinds of protective gear, the right kinds of um, amount of time you allow a child to be in the game, so to speak, and what needs to happen when they do have any kind of injury. And I know that a lot of jurisdictions have gone to um, getting rid of tackle football, particularly um, because at, at certain ages because of the dangers. I think more people are understanding it. Um, we, we look at boxers um, like Muhammad Ali and others who end up with um, the other kind of neurological damage that came from boxing for so long. I think they were able to um, heighten the, um, the uh, an awareness of those kinds of injuries and how important it is to not poo-poo concussions and things like that. Um, so uh, there are those ways of um, sort of, um, of advocating for that. And I think it's not enough. I think we need a lot more and there's not enough research and people love their sports and they did it. They think they're okay. They have problems that they're not addressing. So there's okay for them kids to do it because they're okay. When in fact, they're probably not okay either. But you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a cultural phenomenon in this country particularly um, in that um, we love our stuff so much that we don't worry about the health that it is because we've been doing it for so long. So I'll leave it there. Spot on. And with six minutes to go, um, I would like to piggyback on Darryl, what Daryl was saying regarding resources. Like I said, I just did some, some real Google searches for people of color because I think it's very important that when we find a, a, a person to help us when we're struggling, we treat it like a job interview. You've got to find the right fit because, you know, I compared uh, and during a discussion uh, with someone, uh, they take notes and those notes follow you around the medical system. And if they don't understand you or where you're coming from, those notes can be do more harm than good whenever they're they're transferred into the medical system. So really treat it like a uh, an interview. The first time you meet them, don't just sit down and, and expect to be cured. You know, just find out where they're coming from and what their feedback is. For instance, I give the example of, you know, being a black woman, maybe if I don't have time to always prepare my hair and, my, you know, look right, you know, I might throw on a cap and, and it might be like during a telehealth thing or something, I might throw on like a, a ski cap or whatever I can find to get on this camera, right? Well, if you got a white therapist, they can take notes like, you know, wearing a ski cap in the middle of summer, not appropriately dressed for the season or condition. A black woman therapist will say, won't even note it because they know what it's like having to deal with black hair and everything else and trying to get out the door at the last minute. So please be sure to, when you meet someone and, and, and you know treat it like a job interview, figure out where they're coming from and ensure that whatever is reflected on your file is truly the situation and not just their perception. Hi, can Andy, I just say before you go to Andy, just about what you just said, that white folks have bad hair days too. Greasy what? Greasy hair. <laughs> I'm just hair saying in general. Wet. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I agree with you. Notes reflect. No, no, I'm agreeing with you. I'm pointing out the racism in that situation. In that a therapist that looks at a white woman that's having a bad hair day and a black woman that's having a bad hair day and writes different notes about those people. Right. So we got four minutes oh, left. Anne is yeah. still trying to comment. Uh, and the other thing we had that discussion about is is cultural expression, right? If you say if you like smacking the hell out of somebody, that that is just an expression of, of yes, venting. Whereas a white therapist may put down violent tendencies, things like that. So you really have to know who it is you're seeing before they make notes on your file that'll follow you around. Hi, Anne. You've been waiting patiently. I'm so sorry that that we've taken your time. No, sure. Um, it's been really interesting. Um, I had this experience, you're talking about attitudes, where I popped into my doctor's office. I had private insurance, but I, what I didn't know was I came in on Medicaid day and the whole office was different. It was much more crowded. The staff was sort of aloof, like not so friendly, and they had taken all the magazines out. <laughs> so it was like, um, but what just occurred to me was if that was going on in the waiting room, what's going on in the office? Like, 
are those people having less time uh, you know, to describe their symptoms? Is the doctor having the same aloof attitude because they're not getting as much money? It just brought up a whole lot of issues for me. So just throwing out that out there. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. And there, there's a lot of questions about why some go into the mental health field. You know, there's there's a high percentage of people reportedly that themselves have experienced mental health issues, and that's why they took an interest in the field. And maybe they're not always really cured. So that's another reason you should really bet who it is that you see um, for help. Thank you. So with that, um, we have about two minutes left. Did anyone else have any Got suggestions or further commentary? Okay, uh, it seemed that, that um, there I, are not, oh, sorry, I, I, I hear someone. No, I, I was gonna say, I did have one one point to to mention. Um, this is something that uh, is talked about amongst clinicians where I am at, but not necessarily is known by a lot of people. There has been a large shift in mental health uh, in terms of behavior where um, if, instead of having the standard of care 50, 55 minutes, um, they're trying to push clinicians to do 30 or 15 minute sessions where they give somebody five different things that they maybe can do and try to push them out the door by six sessions max. And um, that people are going to school for this now. It's, it's a huge unaddressed problem um, I, that you know partly came as a result of expanding access, but instead of doing it properly, there's just this incredibly problematic um, rise that I, I don't know how many people are really aware of. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending our session today. I hope this is the beginning of, of more open communication in regards to this topic. And perhaps at some point, um, people will begin to meet and figure out how we can all care for one another. I'm in our communities and as Green Party members. Thank you very much. And hopefully everyone has a wonderful day and take care of yourself and others. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dee. Bye. Bye, thank you.